What's going on, guys? Blacklisted Voice, episode 28, hopefully. Uh, Logan and I here, we're, uh, we're having a discussion on longevity this week. Um, undecided when we're going to release this podcast. Uh, I didn't tell you this yet, but we might release it after the Open. So if you guys are listening after the Open, this is a perfect time um, to maybe listen to this if you're a little beat up or if you kind of have some more competitions coming up this season, um, might be able to 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 get some foresight into um, the rest of your season and maybe how to set up your athletic career if you're looking to compete for extended periods of time. Um, but yeah, uh, so talking about longevity in the sport today, specifically CrossFit's a little bit of an interesting one. Um, we just had the retirement of Matt Frazier after 2013, right? Yeah, yeah, 2013. Yeah, so, we said he'd I mean, this was his, he went to the game seven times, right? Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, 14 to 21. So, yeah, that'd be right. like seven times. I think his yeah. first, yeah, his first regionals was 2013, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think he, I think he had been competing um, for like six months before that or something. Yes. So yeah, that's correct. He told me that he like started at um, Danny Haran's gym and then went to a local competition like a month later and won it and was like yeah oh. i think that's the story <laughs> might have a knack for this <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so um yeah so matt is done uh seven years into the sport or about seven or eight years into the sport yep. uh, and you know i think we kind of see some anomalies with like rich froning um jason kalipa was a was like Man, he was about seven or eight years, I guess, yeah. I think. Yep. Yeah, a lot of those guys have died. I mean, that generation that have, you know, stopped uh, competing or just, you know, um, yeah. CrossFit recreationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess uh, to start off the podcast, I guess we'll kind of like define longevity. Uh, um, Logan's kind of got a, a pretty good definition of it. Yeah, man. I think to me, longevity is just how long you're able to stay at your peak or around it. Like everyone's going to have, um, you know, that significant dip off, you know, where they're like, they were once way up here. And then for whatever reason, maybe a couple of years, you know, after that point, they're like way down, you know, they have a lot of injuries or they haven't really been able to train or just like, maybe they're just, they got that you know, far enough away from kind of like the peak, you know, male age um, within the sport and they just kind of fizzle out, which is fine. Like it's, it's going to mm -hmm. happen to everyone. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, your ability to stay at or near your peak, um, just like look at someone, um, you know, like Tom Brady, like he's, he's for sure not as good as he m may have peaked at, you know, but he's still really good and he's actually yeah. adapted adapted um adapted the way that he plays the game as far as like um he's having to just have more head knowledge or you know mm -hmm. really really understand the defense is even more because um you know he's not maybe not as quick as he used to be yeah, or yeah. you know kind of adapting your way to the game and just knowing that you're not where you used to be but it doesn't mean that you're going to get worse it's just you have to train differently mm -hmm. um but i think in my opinion in the sport um man i would love the one guy that i would love to have a conversation with would be scott panchik and yeah. he's probably in my mind the one that has done it the best like he's i mean heck the last time they had the games he was top 10 and he's been top 10 for a long long time yeah and yeah. Yeah. he hasn't really shown much of a like dip off and he's yeah yeah 33 almost 34 um, yeah. And he's outlasted everyone um, that was kind of in his generation. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can't, I might be wrong, but I can't really think of anyone like Dan Bailey, Jason Kalipa, Rich yeah. Froning, all of them are either doing team or something else, but none of them are, I would say individual games athletes. Yeah. 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 I think, um, yeah, I mean, he's definitely – I mean, we'll see. Like, he obviously took the year off to try and go team last year, right. and then that, that didn't work out. But yeah. <laughs> um, So I guess we'll see if he's still competing at a pretty high level because if he's 33, he would have been 
like 31 last year, which I still like, I think that's Matt's same age, isn't it? 31, 31. Uh, yeah. Matt, Matt would have think. Yeah. Matt turned 31 in this, yeah, this January, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so, if, so I guess we'll kind of see if he's like able to retain that um, high level of performance this year going into the individual side of things again, because he's obviously not on mayhem now. So that'd be yeah. kind of interesting thing to see. Um, yeah, that'll be super interesting because I would, yeah, I would say like once you get past 32, yeah, like that's where it starts to kind of really catch up with you. That yeah, 32, yeah. like I, I think there's like a time where it, where it, um, where you can also maintain. It's like you yeah. get to this age and then you might not get better, but you're not going to get worse. And yeah. Then you yeah. just gradually start getting, and then I think you gradually start getting worse. Um, yeah. As just, you know, I think, those, go ahead. Yeah. I think like, um, I, I'd have to look this up again, but I think it's like around 30, like the male's central nervous system. And sorry, we're not talking about females right now. Yeah. Um, but I think around 30, the male's central nervous system, like starts to, um, like Peter off a little bit. So like yep. their power starts to decrease inside the sport. So yep. that's probably why you're seeing, um, you know, some guys start to Peter off. Like, I think Dan got injured and that like had a shoulder injury and then he was basically done. Like he tried to come back the year of the ring dips and dumbbell snatches tore his pec and then yep. was just totally done after that. So yeah. um, I almost wonder if it's just like a petering off of the central nervous system. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, testosterone is for sure related. Like your testosterone yeah, yeah. has to dip. And I yeah. think I saw, um, I can't remember. Like it's, I've heard before that like after age 30 or 31, you start to lose like 1% of your muscle mass per year um now i i can't I, i'm pretty sure um that's i would have to see where i saw that but it was like a peer peer reviewed um study uh, yeah but yeah i mean that's it that's why it's like i always tell people like when you're young and lift as much as you possibly can <laughs> to just retain as like yeah like obviously not crossword but just people like general pop yeah, um, yeah. Because once you get to a certain age, it starts going. Doesn't mean you can't build it, um, right? Right. But it's just it's gonna stick around. It's gonna you know, be a lot harder to go into atrophy a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I also think one thing too that like probably affects a lot of people. Like, so we we reference like um, NFL uh, players. Like, I think Frank Gore is another one who's had like a significantly long career as a running yeah, back. Yeah, he has specifically. Um, but the other thing is like people don't make money in this sport like right. at all. So I mean, right. unless you're Frazier or like winning or Froning, like winning the games, like, so, you know, the stress of trying to like earn an income where I think a lot of the old individuals or the old breed, like prior to the growth of Instagram um, was like, I'm going to own a gym and the gym's going to be my income for me just working out and trying to go to the games. And yep. then like, people find out how hard it is to actually yeah. own a gym and how much work exactly. it is. And so exactly. like cult cultivation of like not being able to be like a full-time athlete and then, um, you know, having to um, work a full-time job, like is probably just a huge stress and drain. Oh on yeah. Individuals. Oh, I mean, for sure. That's like one of the big reasons why I like stopped competing was we started this up and it was like, I can't have two focuses and expect, both to be good you know yes for sure so i think that's probably another thing um yeah like it's just it's too much stress it's like that's why i tell people it's like if you're really gonna be in this for a long time like you you have to have a job that's gonna allow for it like you yeah. can get by for a little bit but like because i've been in the same situation where you know i worked really long days and it was not sustainable yeah, um, yeah like you can do it like i did it for like a year but it's just really tough and, yeah and, uh, and i would i'd be really curious to see like let's just say crossfitters had the same salary as you know a professional sport like let's say football like how long they could like stay around for like i think yeah. uh james harrison spent like six figures a year 
on stuff to keep his body functioning at the level that he needed to function at. I mean, yeah, he, played, for sure. he played line linebacker till he was 40. Yeah. You know? So I would be very interested to see like if, if CrossFitters were able to have that income and then if they could just pour that money into just like keep taking care of their body, like a, what the sport would look like and b how much longer could they actually, you know, be in the sport. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So I guess maybe uh, we open it up with body work uh, as the, yeah. <laughs> the number one thing uh, you can do to like keep longevity in the sport. Um, but yeah, like, so um, you're starting to see it more now from Rich. Like I've seen in a couple of his videos, he's like has professional body work, like people at his, you know, barn or ranch or what, whatever the, whatever he works out, out at now. Yeah. Um, and like you see it in LeBron, he spent like what 1.8 million or something on body work alone last yeah. year. So like, <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, if, uh, if you are trying to have longevity in the sport, um, body work is a must, like it's an, it's a need. Um, yep. we obviously just did a podcast on that. So if you guys want to listen to like great ways to recover. You can listen to that one episode 27. Um, for me personally, it was like finding a good massage therapist. Like if I could have, you know, a massage a week or a massage every two weeks, obviously that, you know, starts to add up. Um, I think that would have been able to keep me um, in the sport for an extended period of time, a little bit long, maybe like if I didn't have life stress, like it could have kept me in the sport till like 31, 32 possibly. Yeah. So um, I don't know, you're, you've obviously, you have just done some body work, so I don't know, or gotten yeah. some, some stuff yeah. done. Yeah, I mean, body work is huge. Just as far as just like keeping, um, I mean, CrossFit is just such a stressful sport on, yeah. um, you know, on soft tissues. So it's like you have to get that soft tissue work done. You have yeah, to. Yeah. Um, and also, and with that, like a lot of it is your daily habits too. Like, mm -hmm. Uh, making sure you foam roll, making sure you have any tight areas, you know, taken care of before it gets leads to an injury. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like basically to where, like whenever you go get body work done, um, it can be for a specific issue as opposed to like everything's tight. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, like finding someone that is, you know, uh, knowledgeable on the body. And I would say finding someone that understands the sport too, for uh, sure. or at least what you're doing. Cause like that's, yeah. there's just certain things that they'll be able to help you with that someone that doesn't know what, you know, CrossFit is or like yeah. this yeah. kind of stress that you're putting on your body. Um, so yeah, that's, that's super important. Um, yeah. If you can get things like uh, I re I've um, recently tried out PRP, uh, mm -hmm. like a joint injection um that's probably it's expensive but that's been something that uh was really really great um yeah. especially just with how much joint stress like you're gonna have inflammation especially yep. like like it's one of those things where you can't really fight it um like i myself do a lot of movement work within my training um and really you know take care of you know making sure i warm up cool down um, but just like the sheer volume of the sport, like you're going to have tendonitis, you're going to have, like, it's, it's just going to happen. Yep, yep. Um, and I think a lot of people maybe, I mean, it's not like a rite of passage or anything. Um, but like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's going to happen. And yeah, like, yeah. if you take care, if you're always taking care of your body, um, and then you have those issues that so, will, then you can kind of use those like, like dry needling or PRP to kind of help out with that. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, learning your training intensities, but there's like a, there's like a minimum. If you want to be in the sport, you have to be able to do this volume. Yeah. And if you can't handle it, well, I mean, you're just always going to be limited by that. Right. Um, right. But yeah, so those have been things that I really like. Um, yeah. like I said, you know, it's, it is expensive. Um, yeah. but for me, it's like, it's very important that I stay healthy in the sport. Um, so, you know, it's just where your priorities lie. Um, yeah. those, those are, those are some good ones that I've seen. I think yeah. those three are the three recovery 
modalities that you can have done that actually for me that have actually worked yeah um, like is. cupping has been okay um but yeah just like deep tissue um prp and dry needling like those are the ones that absolutely i can say yes they work yeah yeah um, I, we, I haven't really messed around with like like have you have you seen that like light therapy and like kind of yeah the, i'm, the I'm had deprivation a, tanks i've had it done before um i we kind of chatted about this on our last podcast um and there's one one point i want to caveat off of some some things you're saying but like yeah I think with therapies, like you just, you need to try them all because everybody for is sure. so different. Um, yes. you know, cups might work for one person. Another person might like hate the sensation and be like, get these fucking things off of me. You right. know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, dry needling might be too intense for somebody that's like, you know, maybe experienced a lot of trauma in their life. Um, or like, you know, had a horrific accident where like, maybe they just, I don't know if this would ever happen, but like had a nail gun or something like that go into them and now they can't do like needles, needles you know? So yeah. it's just like, uh, you know, I think it's like, um, you just need to try everything and just kind of see what works for you. I've had the, I've had that light therapy done before. I didn't really notice a difference from it. Um, that's not to say it wasn't working. Um, but you know, I, I've talked to other people who have like sworn by it. So, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, I, it, it's, I think a lot of it is just person dependent. And I, I was having this conversation with, with uh, someone earlier today is like, if it, if, if it feels good, don't wait for the science to come out on it. Just do it. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Behind, yeah. Always behind, you know, training therapy, et cetera. So yeah. You know, if, if it works for you, like get that body work done because, you know, 20 years, 10, 10 years down the road, if you're five years into the sport, like getting consistent body work is going to allow you to go another five versus another two or whatever. Right. Right. Um, right. But you, you had talked about like making sure that you're keeping up with daily habits so you can, you can go in and like, you know, use the, the body work for specific targeted areas. Um, right. And like this kind of caveats off into another, another point here. But if you are, uh, you know, keeping up with some daily habits, keeping up with activation work, keeping up with, um, you know, making sure that your movement pattern or your, your glutes are activating, your shoulders are in a good position, like your lats aren't too tight, the tension is down in your body, then you can go in and you can get that movement work to address your movement quality specifically. So, you know, if you're um, you know, your QLs are tight and you can't hinge very well, or like it's restricting your glute activation. Now all of a sudden, you, you know, maybe it's not painful, but you're not aching like up in your shoulders anywhere, but you can go in and you can use that body work now to improve your movement quality where like, maybe we loosen up your QLs or your lats or something. And now all of a sudden you're able to, you know, activate your glutes a little bit better, or hinge a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, and like, when you're able to do that now, now you're not using your low back to over pull on a barbell or, um, you know, your lats are too tight. So now we avoid, you know, low back issues. Now we avoid, um, lat issues and we can actually put force of that movement into the proper, um, you know, movement pattern or the proper musculature can move that load. And now over the course of, you know, tens of thousands of reps in a year, your your force production through that through the specific tissues that is, are supposed to be used is like greater and now you're not yep. putting all that force production into you know shitty movement quality that's yeah. gonna speaking from experience destroy your shoulders <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure for sure yeah it like it's one of those things where if you do everything that you could possibly do by yourself with movement work when you go in to get tissue work or movement work done, then they can help you a lot more because then they're spending all their time on stuff that you, that you have to get someone else to do, you mm -hmm. know, like whenever I go in, like they really work on like behind my scaps and like really dig in there. Like I can't really do that by myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so it's like, I mean, heck you're, you're essentially saving money. So, you know, yeah, they're, yeah. they're able to spend more time on the stuff that you can't do by yourself. So yeah, I think, I think that's huge.
Yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, like movement quality is a huge aspect of, of, you know, creating longevity in the sport. And I'm, I'm not sure if we, we kind of touched on, like Logan said, you know, staying at your peak for an extended period of time for longevity. Um, I think, you know, 10 plus years specifically in the sport of CrossFit is, um, some pretty good longevity for the sport. Um, if we look at a lot of other sports, we're looking at, you know, running backs in, in football or if you, if you consider college, um, you know, a pretty high level for them. Um, you know, they're looking at six to eight years. They usually retire by what, like 25, 26. Yeah. I think the average age is 26. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're looking at six to eight years there. Um, uh, I think quarterbacks probably play a little bit longer. Linemen probably pay, play a little bit longer. I think linebackers are another one that's like a little bit shorter on the. Yes. Definitely yeah. Shorter. Definitely. So, yeah. I so receiver, I think, receivers have a pretty, they can stay around for a good bit. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, I think it's like around 10 plus years to kind of touch, touch on that again. Rich has been doing that for, you know, 11 or longer than that now, I think. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, like, you know, if you think of that again, so 10 years, 10 plus years of a squat pattern, a hinge pattern and a press pattern and upper pulling pattern, like you're putting, you know, and if you look at Rich's volume, like, you know, he does up to three workouts, maybe more a day, um, you know, thousands of, you know, hundreds of contractions a week and multiply that by, you know, 52 and you're at, uh, you know, thousands up to 10,000 of contractions, um, in a year and multiply that by, you know, another 10 years, like you're looking at, you know, tens of thousands to close to a hundred, maybe a hundred plus thousand, um, contractions in those specific, you know, movement patterns. So, if your shoulders are, you know, missing a specific range of motion, and now you have a little bit of compensation inside of a workout or inside of a movement, like your joints are just going to take an absolute beating. Um, your tissues are going to take an absolute beating. Um, and that's just going to, you know, that's going to slow you down like an injury, like Dan Bailey, yep. he was notorious for not having, not to call anybody out, but <laughs> he was uh, notorious for having, you know, really inflexible shoulders. Yeah. And then he gets a pec injury from doing ring dips at a pretty uh, intense pace, dumbbell snatches and ring dips. Um, and now, you know, he's basically out of the game. I think he might be trying to compete in masters this year, but mm-hmm. it, you know, that was a career ending injury that, you know, he couldn't compete at um, a high level anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess movement quality is like a huge one. If you're looking for longevity in the sport, it's just making, making sure you're moving well so yeah. you can continue to move well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, like even things that you don't even think yeah. will end up mattering. Like for me, I stepped up with my same foot for bar face and burpees for years and years and years. Yeah. And I developed this hip pain on on one of my hips and then back pain on the same or erector pain on the same side. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it wasn't anything like, you know, detrimental, but it got really tight and my hip would always uh, bother me every few months. And I finally realized when I'm stepping up my back is basically, I'm basically turning and putting pressure just on that one side. And then same thing with sandbags. Like I always mm-hmm. threw it over the same shoulder and it would be on my right side. So that erector was getting worked more. And honestly, mm-hmm. ever since, so I started stepping up with like alternating feet, obviously in a competition, I'll still step up and like with the same foot, just cause it's, it's just faster. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll alternate in training. And then with sandbag training, I'll alternate shoulders. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's, it's worked uh it's worked pretty well but it's like little little things like that that you don't even think matter end up mattering when you've been in it for such a long time yeah 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 and like even uh you know mixed grip deadlifting um that's something i've had a lot of my athletes getting away from is just straight up going clean grip because you start to get that little bit of rotation like that one side just a little bit stronger and maybe you're stepping up with that side in burpees too and now all of a sudden you get like that that QL gets a little bit stronger on that one side and then boom, it's like back injury. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, I've actually been doing that now, just like going clean grip, 
um and like my back feels a lot better yeah 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 so but obviously like for competitions i'll switch it and do whatever yeah. works faster but like that's the thing like um and i would say too uh that goes towards longevity is realizing training is just training yeah and yeah. uh it's like it's good to it's good to train well um but there's differences in training and competition competition only goal is to get points and win training is making sure that you're able to stay healthy for competition and be your best at your competition so like mm -hmm. yeah doing light power snatches in a competition probably when your legs are blown up you can start using a lot of lower back should you do that in training no you know and i learned that the yeah. hard way too um but because it is easier it is easier yeah on, yeah on your heart rate for sure um but yeah that i mean that would be an example of just keeping a better back position and training rather than yeah. you get to competition and it is easier so use it you know yeah yeah and i think that's like you know i i think that's like an original disservice that um you know crossfit has um taught people or maybe preach to people is like you have to go hard all the time and you have yep. to get a good score on this workout so you're gonna you know um revert to compensation patterns to get the best score possible um right like to kind of caveat i have a little bit of a different um thought process on that because like you're gonna have to train some of that compensation pattern a little bit if you're right. if you know you're going to do it in a competition so like right. you can have your compensation pattern be like non-existent and expect to like get reps in at that compensation pattern if i don't yeah. know if that makes sense so like yeah i think every once in a while going to that point is okay like in training because like sometimes you just have to feel it and like yeah you do the compensation pattern to get like touches especially if you're expecting to go there um inside of a competition but it shouldn't be like you know every time you have a snatch workout like you're gonna go unbroken touch and go reps doesn't matter the weight until you like your back can't handle or your legs can't handle it anymore and now all of a sudden you're like using your low back like right you know, once every two weeks you're doing that or once every three or four weeks you're doing that. yeah for sure um but yeah sorry i didn't mean to go off on a tangent there no, yeah yeah i mean and yeah i still it's like one of those things where it's like there's not a cut and dry like you should do it yeah many yeah. times a week but like for me personally like if i'm going against someone and i feel like i need to win then i'll just you know do whatever it takes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep 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 yeah i think like uh you know in a lot of other sports like they you grow up doing training if that makes sense like if you go play basketball you go you have to have, go to basketball practices if you play baseball you have to go to baseball practice and then you know one time a week maybe you know if baseball a little bit more football one one time a week um you get to play your sport yep. um, and you get to compete in your sport but most of that time is spent practicing your sport and that is like you know if you come from crossfit classes you're constantly playing your sport every yeah. single day. And yeah. so then you go into training, you kind of carry that mindset over, or when you go into competing and then you go into training, you carry that mindset over into training instead of treating training like, you know, your practices when you were growing up inside of, you know, little league sports or whatever. So I think like getting the athlete to understand that, getting the athlete to understand like, kind of like what you were saying, like don't go to the compensation pattern in this right. session. Like right. I want you to, regardless of what your score is, I want you to do all 30 of these, you know, deadlifts with a flat back and using your posterior chain. Right. I don't care if that means resting two minutes between sets of five for the last 10. Like, right. that's what we're doing today. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think like I, I actually uh, set, had an athlete um, said this to an athlete this week and we we're talking about just things that we're going to work on. And I think a lot of people fall into this whenever they come from maybe classes to competing or mm -hmm. comp competitors in general. Um, but like everyone knows, like if, if you're a football player and you're trying to increase your 40 yard dash, um, it would be pretty foolish just to run 40 yard dashes, you <laughs> yeah. know, but like there's, there's so many people that it's like, I need to work on this. So I'm just going to do this. Yeah. All the time. Or like, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm bad at doing, Metcons, I'm just going to do Metcons all the time. So it's right, just right. like, 
And that's where I like having a coach uh, for sure comes in um, into play and just understanding that like in training, you want to train the most trainable aspects to get better. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like same thing, like uh, if you're a pitcher and you need to increase your fastball, just don't go throw fast all the time. You break, I mean, people hire pitching coaches that pay them thousands of dollars and they just break down break down their movement, break down where they could do better. And they spend a lot of very, very tedious time on perfecting the movement before they might even ever throw fast. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think that's, uh, if you can have that mindset as an athlete within the sport, then uh, you're going to be around for a lot longer than, you know, the, the athlete that just wants to go hard all the time all the time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You will eventually break. Trust me. Yep. yep. Uh, <laughs> speaking will. from experience that yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think too, part of it too, is like people really love, I mean, people love the feeling of going hard. Like, yeah, it's a great um, feeling. Yeah. I mean, like, I think a lot of people are calling it, um, God, what is it like the chemical cocktail now? I might be getting that name wrong, but like the the cortisol dump that you get, the epinephrine dump that you get, like this hormonal, like I guess maybe a hormone cocktail that you get from literally pushing yourself to like absolute failure. And you probably get a little bit of dopamine from that as well. Yeah. So like you start to kind of get addicted to that feeling. Um, oh, absolutely. And like, you know, if you can, if you're, if you're in it for the long run, um, which is something we try and, you know, bring our athletes attention to, um, you can kind of rationalize that and be like, okay, you know, I've went pretty hard in these three training workouts this week. Um, I'm supposed to bring intensity in this one today, but you know, I went a little bit too hard on Monday, uh, or harder than, you know, what my coach was wanting. Maybe same. I did the same thing on Wednesday. Like I might be starting to, you know, kind of chase this, you know, hormonal cocktail. Maybe it's time to back off a little bit you know, communication with your coach, like, Hey, went pretty hard this week. Like, I know you wanted me to go hard, like pretty intense in this workout, but I went, went a little bit too hard on Monday and Tuesday. Like I need to back off a little bit today. I'm just going to do this for completion. Yeah. And if you have a good coach, they will not get, they'll actually congratulate you for that thought process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah. So like your coach should not get mad at you for making that decision. Like that's yeah. a, that's a, you know, for an athlete, like their ultimate goal is to push their body. And like, if they're coming to that realization, like that's a huge growing point for an athlete. Um, yes. So yes. given, uh, given the, the like personality slash mindset of most CrossFitters. So yeah, it's like, yeah. if they're saying that they went hard, they definitely went hard. Yeah. yeah. So there might be <laughs> yeah. like other sports where you're like, dude, you did not go hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so that's, that's what's like, like CrossFitters are just like a little bit different that way. Yeah, Um, for sure. But they chase that. But I, I mean, yeah, I definitely remember that, like that, just that dump. Cause like when you first start CrossFit, you just go to one class and you just go so freaking hard. (laughs) And I remember like, uh, when I, we had like a competitor's class at my gym and I was like, so like, do y'all like, what kind of Metcons y'all do? And they're like, oh, we actually just do like a lot of lifting skill work and stuff like that. I remember thinking, I was like, well, that's not going to get me better. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I need to go harder. (laughs) Yeah. You you show up to the class, you're like, God, what a bunch of fucking pussies. Like, I don't want to do this shit. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. When in reality, like, that was probably actually good training. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, totally. Totally. I think, uh, you know, if you can start to one, rationalize like, uh, you know, practice versus, playing your actual sport, um, kind of understand the nuances and the difference of differences in those two. Um, I think, uh, shout out to Cannon. Um, we posted a video of him doing, uh, some power snatches the other day to a metronome, just trying to get his timing down for his snatches. Um, and that's what, you know, practice or training looks like a little bit more of, um, it's just learn. Okay. Like you brought and addressed that you have trouble pulling a barbell consistently off the ground. It might not be necessarily that your heart rate is super high. You might just not understand how to pace that correctly. So now we're, we're giving you, you know, uh, a timing and a rhythm to do 
for those power snatches and for those power cleans. And now you're understanding how to kind of like fall into that rhythm during uh, a workout and your body will just naturally take over to that. So when it does come time to just shut the brain off and go, boom, you already have that built into your repertoire and you're able just to start pulling those snatches on a consistent rhythm. So right. recognizing that, um, I think probably people understand it most from a gymnastic standpoint and like, you know, that's the easiest thing to do skills and drills for. Um, but you know, there's other aspects of the sport that can come into play, um, for, from a practice standpoint. Oh, so, for sure. For sure. Uh, oh, you're going to say something? Sorry. Yeah. Um, just going back to where, um, you're like how an athlete would go harder, um, for a couple of days and then they weren't able to like hit their intensity. I think that is like a good, like, that's kind of how you would want. That's why you want to coach and want a training design that is intelligent because mm-hmm. like, if I were to go, you know, do a class workout every single day, I would go hard every single day. I'll Heck go hundred <laughs> percent every day, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And, take that to where my normal training I might not go hard or to the pain zone maybe once or twice a week but the fact that I'm going easier in my other days actually allows me to go harder when I do go hard yeah yeah Um, so I think that is a lot of times where people get themselves in trouble especially for competitions um, is they go they train so hard that whenever they get to competition instead of being at a hundred percent, they're at like 85%. They're at their training, whatever they train at. And yeah. if someone is tapered and peaked or at least recovered for a competition, they're going to do better. So that's yeah. why they don't compete well is because they're not at their peak ever. You know? yeah. So I think yeah. that's why you want to have, you got to have the, um, just the foresight to be able to follow training and know that, if it like enjoy that the session was not that hard because then you can actually push harder when it's time. Yeah. 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 I actually had seen that from a few teams at the games is like their first day was just not good because they went into the game super tired, but it actually ended up being, you know, they weren't able to elicit good intensity. So it just ended up being uh, lower volume than they were used to, but kind of like a level intensity that they have always kind of trained at. It right. wasn't a step up. And then as you kind of saw them through the weekend, they would, you know, they might finish kind of lower to the pack, but then throughout the course of the weekend, they might float up more towards the middle of the pack because they were actually getting recovered as they went where right. good teams will come in going 100% and, you know, it might be a little bit less volume than they're used to. And they weren't training at super high intensities leading in tapered. And then they kind of, you know, stay at that top level, top 10 right. throughout the course of the weekend. Right. So, um, yeah, to speak to your point, I've, I've definitely seen that from happen to people, um, and happened right. at the games. So, right. Um, yeah, for sure. And like, you know, part, I I think these two go, this is kind of one point that we were talking about um, kind of caveat off of that, but smart training and communication with your coach. And I think these two kind of go hand in hand. Um, And, you know, there are a lot of theories out there inside of the scientific literature, inside of training, et cetera, but everybody is so different. And that's kind of why we are in the art of individual coaching people Um, because what works for one people and what one person and the amount of volume and intensity or perceived intensity for one person, um, or one person can handle volume wise is totally different from the, from the next individual. So you might get an idea of, okay, this person can handle this much volume in this week. They can handle this much intensity inside of this training day or this session. Um, but if you aren't in communication with your athletes, you'll never fully know if that's actually the case and getting an idea of how they feel after their training session. Okay. You know, it seems like this was a seven out of 10 RPE. Um, I was expecting this to be, you know, four or five out of RPE. We need to dial this day back a little bit so that they can reach nine or 10 on, you know, their Friday or Saturday, Saturday workouts or their hard day training through the week. Um, and so I think these two kind of go hand in hand, um, 
and it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of, at least from my experience, takes a little bit of time to have the coach and the athlete really fully understand each other and what they're capable of and what kind of like the athlete athlete needs. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, that, I mean, it's huge. And the thing is like so much of training, um, training, peaking, um, being at your best is so much just stress oriented, like dealing with stress. So like, like you could have some, like the same athlete giving them like the sit, like that. Let's just say you give them the same thing for a year and then they switch a job or have some life stress take over and they might not be able to handle, you know, 75% of that, you know, because at the yeah. end of the day, stress is stress. You yeah. know, it's not like whenever we're talking about, um, you know, overtraining and, um, you know, symptoms of that, um, it's all just stress. Like it's mm-hmm. not, it's not being, I think I saw something where it's like overtraining isn't overtraining. It's just under recovering. And that's so true. It's just yeah. like, you're just, you're just too stressed out. Cause I've been in that same situation where I had a really stressful job. Um, just like, wasn't happy in it. And then training wasn't as great. I wasn't able to elicit that much intensity. Cause I just had things on my mind and just not in a good, you know, happy place. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's important to remember when coaching your athletes um, yeah. and just finding out like, Hey, what's going on? Like you hit this last week and didn't have a problem, but this week it's like, you know, impossible or, Hey, I've noticed the past three months, you really haven't been able to hit any of your, um, your machine numbers or your, 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 constantly complaining about being sore when we haven't really changed up anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's all very, very big and just, um, like what I always tell people, you know, when I first start with them is like, look, like everyone has, you know, um, like their idea, ideal, um, picture of what they want their relationship with their coach to be like, and like how much communication, you know, whether it be daily, weekly or whatever, and you're entitled to whatever you want. But like, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the more you communicate with your coach, the more I'm able to change what you need. And if you communicate with me every, you know, week or two weeks, well, there might've been a problem we could have fixed in a day. And instead we're fixing (laughs) it two weeks later, three weeks later, or there was, there was an injury that happened that, you know, all of a sudden you're like, Oh, well, I injured it three weeks ago. I just never said anything. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, that's, that's why those little things are so important. Cause like sometimes mm-hmm. a little, little fix can just reroute you just a little bit yeah. um, to make sure that you're, you know, keeping that, that path towards your goal um, in yeah. a positive direction. Yeah. Yeah. And like the injury thing is huge. Like make sure you freaking, even if it, you don't even think it's that bad. Like I, can't tell you the number, like I have a military background. So my, my concept of pain was horrible. And I was just, (laughs) I just tried to push through everything and like, until it got to the point where, you know, I couldn't push through it anymore. Um, cause I, and I literally couldn't perform certain movements because of it. And now you're taking, you know, three or four weeks off instead of, you know, three days off. Um, and then you compile that into, okay, well, what, you know, are you, are you now that you're training again, after the three or four weeks off, did you, were you able to unwind everything that all the other compensation patterns that you developed? Yep. Was it just like, okay, you're not in pain anymore. Like you can actually train. So, right. you know, then that would, will lead up, you know, injury after injury, year after year, and they'll just compile, compile, compile. Um, yep. So, you know, if you're in communication with your coach and like, being okay and trusting what the coach has to say when it comes to an injury, you'll, you'll sustain your performance for a right. much longer period of time. Um, right. Same thing, like, you know, with training, like if you're, if you're telling them that, you know, it was a seven out of 10 this day and the coach was like, yeah, I just, I was hoping for a, a four out of 10. Like, you know, if, if the coach isn't looking at that stuff or you're not communicating that with the coach now, all of a sudden, you've got six weeks in of what the coach thought was seven out of, or four out of 10 and you're at seven out of 10 and your average like RPE for the rate of perceived exertion for the week is now like an eight because you're going 9.9 out of 10 yeah. on Mondays and Tuesdays. Like right. that's a, that's a huge difference for intensity that 
um, yes. you're getting inside of each and every week. And that intensity is again, stress on the body, which is going to, you know, if you can't mitigate that stress is going to lead to issues down the road more than it might manifest in an injury. It might manifest in a hormonal issue. Um, but at some point in time, if you keep pushing that intensity too hard for too long, it'll manifest in, into something that's going to yes. shorten your career. For so. sure. For sure. And I want it. I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but man, there's nothing like an injury that will teach you how to take care of your body. I mean, unless, unless you're a Neanderthal like myself <laughs> and don't learn that lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the pain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. Um, so I, I think, a. I guess this can that can bring us into our an, another point we had, but um, like being okay with taking time off. Uh, I think this is something that, you know, type A personality gets attracted to CrossFit and type A personality cannot just relax ever. Um, but, you know, this is your body heals itself and your body adapts to training with time off. And so yep. you're not taking the time off you're literally only blunting your performance no matter how hard it is for you to take that time off you're only blunting your performance and your potential in the long run yes um and it's gonna it's you know you might not reach your goals because of it you might shorten your career because of it due to you know hormonal or or injury injury aspect but you know if you look at uh i mean <laughs> I'm, we're, I'm doing this the day that the Tampa Bay, or we're doing this the day that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had their Super Bowl party. Uh, <laughs> and Tom Brady is like, uh, he's pretty hammered today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. like every sport has their periods of time where they take time off to, to heal their body. Um, right. And, you know, just because you're in a sport that preaches performance and preaches intensity doesn't mean that uh, rule doesn't apply to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I like, like that's like taking time off um, is, you know, like it's the saying where discipline equals freedom. Yeah. And I would definitely, like if you train really hard, you eat right, you sleep well and you had a competition, like, heck you have earned that time off. And like, for me personally, like there's, there's nothing better uh, than being able to like take some days off that you just absolutely earned. Um, <laughs> and like, you can yeah. just say it is literally better for me to rest yeah, yeah. now than to train. Like, and that's a great feeling. And if you never yeah. experience that, you're just not going to be around very long. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like, you just can't keep beating your body and expect it to change. And like, you actually do need times of removing a stressor just so you can stress it again, you know, yeah. because if you're always, always stressing it, you're, it's just like, you've gone numb, you know, where adaptation, you're not, you're going to plateau a, like, you know, considerably like mm. one of my biggest things, like when I feel like, um, you know, someone's plateauing or they're just not really making any progress is like, you know, giving them a deload and then telling them to like, don't track your macros this week. Mm -hmm. um, have like two or three cheat meals and just freaking relax. Um, if you want to hop in on a class workout, sure. Go for it. But like it, it's a very, it's a big reset. And, mm -hmm. uh, if it, sometimes it is hard to do. Um, but man, like if, if you train hard, eat right, sleep well, and after a competition, like just having that time of just being able to take time off is incredible. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, kind of before we kind of get into our last point here, but a, a lot of this is kind of talking about, you know, stress mitigation and like, you know, making sure that you're not uh, withdrawing more than you're putting into the bank. Yeah. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're withdrawing too much, eventually that that account is going to collapse um, and something is going to happen where it's going to be detrimental to um, your progress in, in the sport or progress in general. So, and a lot of times that can be, you know, career ending for, for um, a lot of CrossFitters. Um, one person we hadn't talked about um, was uh, Tasia with, with Mayhem. Um, she just recently kind of put out something on Instagram um, 
where she's not competing this year. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why they bought, brought in the, the two other girls. Um, but I think uh, if, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it had to do with, um, you know, some hormonal things going on. Um, yeah. And, you know, that is, you know, she was down at Mayhem for two or three years um, and she was, you know, continually withdrawing, withdrawing, withdrawing. And eventually that's going to catch up to you. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know how old she is, but I would guess that she, do you, do you have any idea? Man, I think she's a little bit older. Okay. May. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but you know, like looking at her compete, she's definitely still in her prime. Um, yeah, she for sure. Has like, you know, room to grow, but you're seeing this a lot happen a lot with CrossFit athletes is in their prime. They're having to stop because they're so drained. So beat right. up, so, you know, um, so injury ridden. Um, and you know, that's kind of the goal of longevity is maybe you're not good in two or three years. Maybe you're good in five or six years, right. but now you're competing for another five or six years versus right. in two or three and you're done in two. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of like the the underlying cause or underlying um, kind of theme, I guess, of, of this podcast is, is yep. stress mitigation. Um, but yeah, the, I, did you have anything to add to that thought or? No, I mean, I think like the biggest thing that uh, that'll keep you around and keep you doing all these things that you may or may not want to do um, is just like, like you just have to like love the sport, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You just have to like, like who, this is, this is our last point for, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Who would, who would, right. Like who would do this, um, for, you know, for fun if they didn't love it, you know? And that's also the thing that, um, I kind of realized too, is like, we've, we've done a podcast and like touched on a lot of like finding your why. And, um, Mm -hmm. and that's all like, you definitely need that but you also just have to love it. Like you, like not everything, but you just have to love competing. You have to love, um, cause like it'll fade, like, um, you know, the, the fun that you initially have in CrossFit, it'll fade. And, you know, if you're not doing it right, not having the right coach, not having the right training, then you'll get burnt out. Um, and that's also another thing that, uh, just, this is just speaking from experience is like, like you will, if, if you've been in this for, you know, a while, you absolutely will experience burnout. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where just know that it's okay to experience it. Um, and it's going to happen. Everyone's going to experience it a little bit. And I just think it depends on, you know, where, you know, how much you experience. Um, and obviously it's like one of those things, if you're burnt out for like years, you just stop but like um, <laughs> you're pro- yeah like, yeah like it's okay to be feeling that and to keep yeah, pushing yeah. forward and that's yeah. kind of where like like it's kind of like a like a two-part um like two parts within longevity it's like knowing your why and having a passion for the sport and then like kind of bouncing back in between when one's lacking so like when you feel mm-hmm. like your passion is really lacking um then you can kind of more rely on your why and your logic um and then kind of when your why is just kind of like man i don't i don't know what i'm doing anymore you know your passion can kind of um just take over a little bit so yeah it's kind of like a a little bit of a balance but yeah if if you don't just love competing and love um i don't know like a lot of people say love the process but like Sure. I don't know. I it's it's just thrown around so much. Like you're not yeah. really going to love the process. No. Like it, it's pretty painful. Like I hate yeah. I hate counting macros. I hate yeah. being in pain. Like I don't like it. I like yes. the feeling afterwards. Um, yeah. But like if you think that you're gonna like it, it's that's just kind of a lie. Right. Um, right. But I think you can appreciate getting from point A to point B. Yeah. I think that's yeah. kind of what some people mean by the process. But. Um, yeah, you just, you got to have a deep passion for what you're doing, um, to stay around in it for so long. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, you know, speaking from experience again, um, I loved competing, loved competing. Like there is nothing better than like stepping out onto that competition floor 
and literally everything in, else in life is like non-existent. And the only yeah. thing you're focused on is like, is doing the work in front of you. And yeah. it's like something that's so satisfying about that. And then like, you know, the hypervigilance that you get like during a, during a, a workout, like, you know, looking down the lanes left and right and like seeing where everybody else is like, okay, we need to make up time here type thing. Yeah. Um, you know? And, and so to me, that, that is what I loved. I fucking hated going and doing gymnastics, muscular endurance work for yeah. a year, <laughs> like hated it. Uh, but I knew that I could compete at a high level and can continue to compete for longer periods of time in the season if I did this shitty stuff in training right now. Right. Um, and so like rationalizing like the in the moment, like fuck hanging from this pull up bar rationalizing like okay if i hang from this pull-up bar you know it could potentially get me to you know regional sanctionals and then from there even the games right and so like, rat you know i think the hardest thing and where most people experience burnout is in training oh for um, sure and so you know understanding that like uh you know football players practice or i i guess the quote out there right now is like usain bolts like i practiced for four years to run nine seconds you know yeah um, and so like, you know, kind of understanding that in the moment, like this is shitty and like, you might not want to be doing your sets of 10 on wall balls, but knowing that it will allow you to do the thing that you love and to do the thing that you love longer and for extended periods of time inside of the year. Right. Uh, Cause it, like, I've, I have also been there too, where my season was cut short and it is fucking awful. So yeah. like you, you know, that you're, you know, you're not going to be able to continue doing the thing that you love, um, like for the rest of that year. And it's just not, you know, it's not a good feeling to have. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's like, you know, understanding where your passion is. And then when you do start experiencing those like burnout feelings where I think they happen more in training than they do in competing, um, you know, kind of rationalizing that, um, that thought process. Right. Right. Make- so. Yeah. And I think what I always tell people is like, choose your fun. Like yeah. you can either have like a good time and work out and training and then like have fun and then you can go to competition and then not perform at your best, or <laughs> you can do what you actually need to do in training mm-hmm. and have a ton of fun on game day. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, you might not want to work on your bar muscle ups or muscular endurance or L sits or, um, you know, core stabilization work, but if it allows you to get five more reps on your total bar instead of coming down and beat the team next to you, yeah, that is worth it. Yeah. And yeah. That is worth it. And I think there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of like confidence that training gives you going into training mm-hmm. or sorry, going into competition. It's like, there's nothing else that I could have done to myself to get me in a better position. And the person that's standing on this floor is the best version of myself that I could possibly yeah. be. Yeah. Know? yeah. There's a ton of confidence that comes from that. Totally. Um, and just being able to attack the workouts and yeah, like competing, that's where the fun is. And, mm-hmm. um, and if you can just kind of, I think that comes with a little bit of experience. Like some people mm-hmm. might, Oh, that won't come up in a competition. And then what do you know? They're in a competition <laughs> and they skipped out <laughs> on it. You know? everything comes up in competition there's nothing that doesn't come up in a competition now exactly it like, exactly. has failed doing handstand walks in in literally dirt so yeah. <laughs> yes yes and i think there's also like a level of preparation that it needs to be at to be able to do it in competition like yeah you need yeah. like if you if you're okay at something and training uh, it might mean that you're not very good out on the competition floor. Meaning, yeah, yeah. like, if you're not up to a certain level, like, you're not going to have the confidence on the competition floor to do well at it. But if right, you, right. you prepare in every aspect, and then you not only prepare in every aspect, but just vigilant in everything, then you're able to have a ton of confidence within the competition. Um, and, like, you're not going to get in your head. I mean, you still might, but, like, you have less – chances of getting in your head you're going to have less chances of dropping the ball when your team needed you or uh, when you needed you um so yeah just like preparation to the max on everything training um does wonders in competition 
Yeah. Yeah. I, what's the, what's the quote? Like you, you compete to the level of your training or something like that. Yeah. Like you, you're, yeah, you compete, you follow the level of your training Yeah, um, yeah in yeah, competition. Yeah. And like, that's so true. Like yeah. a lot of people, like I, I tell a lot of people, you know, a lot of people think that like good teams, like perform better in like the fourth quarter or when they needed to, but yeah. it's like, they just didn't fail. They yeah. just didn't, not sorry. didn't fail. They just didn't falter. Like they didn't right. drop off, you know, right. they're so consistent. And like, we talk about it all the time, but um, you know, consistency within everything, like competing, training, longevity, like every single one of those things that we talked about, um, if you do them consistently will lead to longevity, not yep. sometimes, but consistency. Yep. Um, yep. And I would say that would be, you know, having a passion for what you're doing, consistency in all aspects of everything we talked about and you'll be in the sport for a pretty long time yep yep yeah that was a good way to to tie that in so i think we'll we'll probably end it there so um thanks for unless you had anything else to, to say no man there. no it's uh i think it's something that you know longevity and just being able to stay around in the sport is something that i feel like a lot of people don't really maybe talk about or yeah. uh, maybe want to talk about. Cause like some people are like, I mean, me, especially like, I didn't want to believe that my performance was ever going to go down because I was older. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know, like yeah. I didn't, you know, uh, so maybe they just don't want to talk about it, but like, it's good to yeah. talk about it, have some things um, that, you know, you can put into your training um, yep. and know, like if you do it right, you can be in the sport for a lot longer. And that that's totally. a pretty good like outcome, you know? Yep. 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 Yeah. I'm, and you know, that's one of the reasons why I coach is like teach the people the mistakes that I made so that you can stay in the sport for, you know, 10, 10 years plus. Right. Um, and so, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think too, like people just get into it so young. Like I remember when I was 20, 21, like I, I was fucking invincible and then 28 rolls around like, Oh, my body's broken, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think like yeah. teaching teaching uh, individuals that from a, from a young age and like allowing them to to do to compete and do the thing that they love for for a longer period of time is uh, you know a fun a fun thing for to watch. So oh, for sure, uh, for sure. Yeah. And so hopefully, hopefully you guys got something out of this. Um, hopefully, we didn't ramble too much and get too <laughs> off topic. I think we tend to do that a little bit more than bit, other yeah. people. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening guys. Um, if you guys are watching on YouTube, um, you guys can also listen to Apple podcast, please uh, subscribe or follow us on Instagram. Um, blacklisted.hq. If you guys are watching on Apple podcasts, um, you guys can subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and please follow us on um, Instagram blacklisted.hq again. Um and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for chatting on this one, Logan. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good time. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll catch you next time.